Dave Gusak. I've worked for about 30 years in, in the various uh, correctional arenas back when I was um, a lot taller. And I've spent a lot of time working in prison. Um, and a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today has to do with the juvenile justice system as well as some of the work that emerged from the correctional institution. And I have to be honest. And you know when somebody starts a sentence with that, I have to be honest, you have to consider what they're really saying. I mean, therefore, everything else is otherwise. Sorry. Um, but I, I have to be honest, when I was first asked to do this, I had to consider where did I fit in with this? How did I fit within the work that you're doing? Because I have to be honest, I, I'm humbled and honored to have been asked to be here. So let me just thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I, I make it all up as I go along. Um, but I, I am honored and humbled to be here and to hear all the things that have been going on and all the work that you're doing to figure out where I fit in with this continuum. And I realized that where I fit in is that I'm towards the end of the continuum where the cycle continues. So I'm working with um, those that were um, the targets of predators who became predators. I worked with the victimized um, who then became uh, those who then victimized others. Um, and so, and even still, while they victimize others, once they're in the system, they continue to be victims. And so, what I'm going to talk about is how art and art therapy helps interrupt that cycle. So, and I hope that, uh, I hope some of this actually makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, uh, I, I usually expect that. So, what I'm going to talk about here is, in this presentation, I will present a general overview of social interactionism and labeling theory. My, uh, my early work emerged from a psychodynamic perspective, trying to explore and understand what was happening within the correctional arena through this, these dynamics. But there was something missing, and it wasn't until I was going through my doctoral work and I was working closely with a sociologist that I recognized that a lot of what was happening within the institutions that maintained and or could interrupt the cycle really could be best explained through a symbolic interaction perspective. So I'm going to uh, have some fun talking a little bit about that today. Um, I'll also explore how art and art therapy promotes relabeling and how it can help dehumanize the dehumanized and demarginal and, and demarginalize the marginalized. In short, what I'm going to talk about is how art and art therapy can help reverse the delinquent label. I'm going to provide case examples of how art and art therapy are beneficial with this population. And finally, I'm going to apologize profusely for going long, offering to buy the next speaker a drink by way of a company. Who's, who's going next? I, I, you, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. I am screwed. All right. I have a bottle waiting in my room. That, that's for me. No, um, but to begin with, before I get into the theoretical orientation, this, by the way, this is why I have no friends. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Rick. Rick was a, a diminutive 12-year-old um, boy that I worked with. And the reason I say that is because I've always wanted to use the word diminutive in a sentence. Now I've, I've done that. I'm very happy. But he was a small boy who lived on the streets of Los Angeles when I was working out there. And he was a gang member. And he was getting into a lot of trouble at home. He had a very poor uh, family life. Uh, he would run around with the gangs, get into a lot of fights when he would show up in school until he was finally sent to the facility where I worked. While he was in our facility, he would oftentimes get into a great deal of trouble because he would, uh, do you know what I mean when I say he would tag his gang and sing these on the walls? Tag would mean graffiti. And he would, he would paint, pardon? Yeah, yeah, he would, he would tag the graffiti on the walls of his gang, which would get him in trouble. Uh, because, and then on top of that, when he tried to cover over the graffiti, or when others would paint over the graffiti, uh, he would get angry at them, would attack them and get into fights. Now, he stood about this high, right? Um, he's a small guy, but he would constantly get into fights, consistently be aggressive with everyone. Um, and so every time the gang insignia were painted over, he would quite angry, would oftentimes end up in restraints. And so um, here's an example of some of the work that was done in East LA, quite possibly by, by his gang. Um, he did receive validation 
an identity through the gang with which he traveled. But it wasn't healthy identity. It wasn't healthy validation. Um, but I realized that there was a need for him to create these works. So I asked permission from the facility if it would be OK if I could work with him one on one, and we could reduplicate some of this graffiti on paper. It wouldn't be hung up. He would create it on paper, and then he would stick these papers in the drawer so that nobody could see them. I was given permission to do so. We spent several weeks redrawing a lot of this graffiti on paper. Then I asked him, what does the gang call you? Everybody within the gang has a special moniker. They have a specific name that they're called. So let's design that. And so he spent a couple of weeks designing that. I said, OK, now, what is the name that your family gave you? What's the name that your mother gave you? And he gave me his name, Rick. That is, of course, a, 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 a pseudonym. He told me his name was Rick, and we started creating name embellishments out of his name. These are samples of some of the name embellishments that I will give, that I will ask my inmates to do. Why is this important? Because what we transitioned from was how he found validation and identity through an unhealthy environment, an unhealthy group, transitioning into creating his own sense of self and identity until we started creating validation for who he was. He became Rick, and it was at that time that he started seeing that who he was was accepted by someone else. Up until that time, that self was rejected, and now he recognizes that through the art process, he can start being accepted for who he was. It was at that point that he started calming down, he started interacting well, and eventually he was able to be released from the institution. I get, it was at that point that I started looking at what exactly are the dynamics that are happening. And so what emerged during my work was the social interaction and labeling theory. Now, social, interaction, social interactionism is a framework through which social reality is interpreted. William James is considered the father of American psychology. We don't know if that's true. There's never been a paternity test. But <laughs> thank you for that. Sorry, that was a lot of fun. Sorry. <laughs> William James was also, this is, again, this is scary. Um, this, William James was also was a sociologist who started examining how people are identified. And he recognized that there was such a thing called multiple me's. And I find it very interesting that this is coming towards the end of a lot of discussions about disassociation. But what he said was that there was a single I, but multiple me's. And those multiple me's would emerge based on the interactions with whom people had. So based on those interactions is how we develop our sense of self, right? Uh, later on, that was uh, expanded by Mead, uh, George Herbert Mead, and then by, by uh, Bloomer, Cooley, and Dewey. It sounds like a, a law firm in Manhattan, but they were all sociologists out of the Chicago School. And they contended that who we are and how we see ourselves is contingent upon who and what we interact with. But interactions may not be just between people. And this is key. This is the exciting part. This is where I get really happy. All right, so they're not just between people, but may, uh, but may also be between people and objects. Artifacts have meanings for people, meaning which is not intrinsic to the object, but arises from how the person is initially prepared to act towards it. And George Herbert Mead said such objects include uh, not only tangible objects, but also ideas. But then if we take this further, we realize that such objects can also include what? Art. What? Institution. Institution. You're a frightening person. No, um, <laughs> it is about art and that they can interact with art and identity can be created through art with how people interact with and through art. You see why I got excited? You with me? Excellent. All right. So the sharing of such objects and the interpreta interpretation thereof define and shape an interaction, thus helping relationships create new meanings. Such objects, according to Howard Becker and Gilmore, include art. Simply put, meanings and interpretations are social products. Now, within this theoretical perspective, within this theoretical perspective, uh, lies labeling theory. Labels are provided by those dominant within a society. So definitions are dependent upon constructing norms of society. And society's reaction to situations that run counter to those norms. If the majority defines the minority, the majority also determines who belongs to that minority. And such labels are then derived from that definition developed by the majority, and people are then categorized as such. 
definitions or labels can be po uh, oppressive or positive. Thus, through oppressive labels, identity can be stripped away, reinforcing a loss of self, deliberately disempowering and objectifying them. Take it to the extreme, there's power in labels. The institutions with where we work rely on this. They recognize that we strip identity from the people that are placed in these institutions because it's easier to control them. We take away their sense of self and we replace it with uh, a uniform that everyone wears and we give them a number. And through that number and through that uniform, they are now known as a delinquent or they are known as inmate. And that becomes their identity. And it is hard to shake a label. Once designated, it holds on. What also emerges from such labels is role taking. It affects the self concept and identity. This identity is then acted upon. If negative behavior ensues, the label that results perpetuates this identity, creating a cycle that is difficult to break. I'm going to talk about how the spiral has begun, how the delinquent is first labeled. Societal interactions perpetuate and maintain deviant tendencies. Remember, the majority determines the minority. The majority determines what laws are broken. They determine who is considered deviant from society. Howard Becker, who I indicated first determined that art was a way of interaction, wrote a book back in 1957 called The Outsiders. And it was the first book that defined what deviance meant. There were two groups that were labeled as deviant in that, in that book. Do you know what those groups were? What's that? Uh, uh, not, you would think it was, was not homosexuals. Yeah. It was, believe it or not, jazz musicians and marijuana smokers. Yeah. <laughs> jazz musicians, which is, I, I happen to be a huge Miles Davis fan, and that other part we're not going to talk about. But, but so in, in, indicative of that, I would be considered deviant from that society because the culture at that time determined that they were considered on the fringes. Take that to another level, all people that we institutionalize are now considered on the fringes, and we hold them there. All right? So, adolescents, as a rule, impulsively act and react. Some do as a way to express and release confuse, confusing and unbidden frustration and anger. Some do so because they experience neurological or psychological difficulties. Regardless, such actions are unfortunately considered unacceptable to society's standards. Thus, they result in sanctions, isolation, and punishment, eventually detention. This begins the perpetual downward cycle. And the juvenile populations take on this identity. I was working with a population in Kansas City when I was working with the court system, and I was running a group with juvenile detention program, and what they told me, apropos of nothing, was that they considered this gladiator school. And that to graduate from gladiator school meant that they would be going to prison. That was their goal. They accepted the label they were given, and they knew that through this training, they will eventually be able to survive prison. That's where they saw themselves going. Now imagine our work is trying to interrupt this cycle when the institutions itself continue to perpetuate these labels. This in turn reinforces the negative self-perception, perpetuating a cycle. Labeling informs self-appraisals and in turn perpetuates delinquent and deviant tendencies. Simply locking someone up likely continues the downward spiral by reinforcing the deviant self-appraisal. Now, of course, as I've been saying over and over again, and I'm trying to hit it home, deviant and delinquent identity is maintained through an interactive process between those that break the rules and that reinforce them. The feedback loop that you saw earlier between the two, uh, the two parties continues here. This is a feedback loop. We take on the identity of the group that has provided us with identity. All right? But wait, and this is the cool part. We have a secret weapon. We can break the cycle. What can we use? Art. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention. We have the art. Absolutely. Oh, excuse me. Do you hear that? That sounds like I'm going to puberty. I'm sorry. That was bad. She was like, <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk now about the benefits of art and art therapy within this population. A lot of this has emerged through the correctional arena and now is applied to the, devi uh, to the delinquent population as well. So I'm going to talk about how art and art therapy can cathart and sublimate aggressive and violent tendencies. We know what catharsis is, right? Yes. 
Catharsis is when you were laughing before, you were catharting. I was catharting. I'm, I catharted before, I'm ready to cathart again. It's an explosion of energy, positive or otherwise. Sublimation takes it much further. Next. Oh, sorry. Sublimation takes it much further. Now, sublimation is a psychodynamic term. Thankfully, they don't own it because all of us can relate to the notion that if we can sublimate energy, we can take this energy, make it more socially appropriate, delay it, and channel it into something so much more productive, like art, right? It also promotes nonverbal communication in an environment where any inadvertent disclosure of weakness and vulnerability is taken advantage of, where people inside wear masks to protect themselves, we can work behind that mask to have therapy happen. And the nice thing is, if I do my job right, I don't have to talk. The art does all the work for me. Because you know why that is so valuable for me? I am extremely lazy. I would much rather the art did the work for me. If I could just sit back. What I do is, and now this is not a bad word. My job as a therapist is to <laughs> manipulate the situation. People think manipulation is a bad word. Maybe it is, we've all had experience, but when we manipulate the art, when we manipulate the directors, we can create a trajectory of treatment that would allow a creation of a new identity, a new sense of self. It uh, can bypass defenses, including uh, dishonesty. Do the uh, delinquent populations, do the people that we have inside, do they lie? <clears throat> yes, but do they tell the truth? Yes. Sometimes we just don't know when that is. But the nice thing is, the art itself does not lie. Now maybe the content does, but the formal elements of that art does not lie. We can get to what's really happening through the art process without them having to say it out loud and without them having to make up other stories, right? Which is why on a monthly basis, I have my wife draw. Oh, that was me. That's how I said that. She's Sicilian, she's bigger than I am. And I know what you're thinking, you're like, everyone's bigger than you are. I get it. All right. It also promotes necessary diversion and emotional escape from difficult surroundings. Those of us who have done art, when we get caught up in the art, time passes by. We're able to escape where we are. Now, I have to be honest, again, when I do these presentations in prison and I'm talking to wardens and I'm talking to administrators, I don't point this out because for some reason, they don't want the people inside to escape. I don't know why that is, <laughs> right? But the truth is we allow them an opportunity to separate from where they are at that time permits the inmate to express himself in a manner acceptable to both inside and outside culture. It creates a bridge. When we look at the artwork, we see a real person. It creates a relationship. It creates uh, recognition that there is really somebody inside. It promotes self-validation and accomplishment. And of course, it helps reestablish a new identity. So we can slow the spiral down through the interaction of art. <coughs> art is an extension of someone. For a person who has not yet been seen as acceptable or doesn't feel like they've been accepted by others, if they create an art piece and you then in turn accept that art piece, you then in turn accept them. They feel validated because you've taken something that they worked so hard on, even if they're not a good artist, and that's key. Because it's the process of the art making, the process of creating one's identity and having someone else accept it that's the key to the work that we do. So by interacting with and through the art, a new social dynamic emerges. Paradoxically, through creating together, the individual's previous labels fade and replaced by new ones because within a group or people who are creating together, they start to see each other as someone real, someone different, somebody worth getting to know. And then, of course, simple mastery of the materials may promote a new sense of self-worth apart from previously established hostile and deviant identities. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the end of this presentation, but I will be doing workshops tomorrow where I'll be reintroducing some of these concepts. So if you plan on being there, that's wonderful. Um, if you're not, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> As the individual creative begins to anticipate what the work might mean for others, he or she recognizes others' perspectives and may in turn develop empathy for their views. Imagine this concept that when the artist starts to create work not just for themselves, but to recognize that other people may see another meaning for this art, that we're creating this as a means of connecting with others. 
how that work is accepted, how it's anticipated by others, how I can start to learn how it can be anticipated by someone else, I develop a sense of empathy. I break through those sociopathic tendencies that may have landed me there. I start to see other people as real, and they in turn start to see me as real. We're starting to break that cycle, right? There's been a great deal of research about the benefits of art therapy in these environments. Um, I have done a number of empirical studies relying on the formal elements art therapy scale and a number of established psychological assessments uh, looking at pre and post um, uh, uh, assessment evaluations uh, through the prisons from the mid 2000s, uh, 2003, 2009. And there's also been a lot of work done in the criminal <coughs> justice settings as well. Sitzer and Stockwell developed an arts program for at risk youth. And they found that there was a significant increase in social and emotional functioning by those that took part in the arts programming. Parts and Thick discovered that the majority of the juvenile offenders that took part in art therapy was instrumental in developing connections to others and including self-approval and self-appraisal. They started to see themselves as human as well. Cohen and Cogney found art therapy valuable in addressing interpersonal problems and resolving personal and interactive difficulties. As more people engaged in the art, the more there was a decrease in incident reports, the more that there was an increase in socialization and problem solving, there was an increase in mood, and more significantly, there was an increase in locus of control. I know, I'm just as happy as you are. And then some uh, jerk along with Chapman, Rosal, and Van Doyen, uh, understood that taking part in art therapy can interrupt the cycles of deviance and delinquency by strengthening a sense of self, providing an avenue to express negative emotions in an acceptable and appropriate manner. What I've often said to people is I have been attacked by a chair, and I've been attacked by people's artwork. And I will tell you something, I much prefer being attacked through their artwork. So when they channel that aggression and they create an art piece that may be attacking me, my ego is at the door. I'm okay with this. I would much rather that they develop and present these negative emotions and negative impulses through the art process. Um, it also creates new and shared meanings and taps into empathic responses crucial to the maintenance of healthy interactions. I have a few minutes. I'm going to show you a couple more cases. Um, I promised you three minutes back, right? Okay. You're not going to hold me to that, are you? Yeah. All right, good. I want to tell you really fast about the case of Kevin. Uh, he was a gentleman who was about uh, 17 years old. He was biracial. Um, he had a lot of difficulties in his home life. Um, read in that that he was greatly abused up until the time that he was around 15 or 16. He was put in a facility. He was made fun of by others in the facility because he was biracial, as you know. Um, my country, the United States, is greatly tolerant of racial identities. <laughs> Sorry. Can you... Sorry. I thought I could get through that. It's a horrible situation now, but of course, even during those times, um, biracial identity was considered something worth attacking or being made fun of in the institutions. Uh, he was uh, arrested and brought into the facility because of narcotic possession and use. Um, within the facility, he got into a great many fights. While he was inside, he did not enjoy at all, in any sense of the word, the art therapy process. However, sitting with him, being present with him, accepting the art that he was doing, eventually he was willing to explore the work that he was doing. And he did this illustration of what he considered his own anger. And he identified all parts of these as elements of his anger, the horns, the, the flying beast. And here's the interesting part. We have this little figure down here. He doesn't know who this is. All he knows is that this figure is unable to slay this beast. Now again, based on some of the things that we've been talking about for the past couple of days, I think that is quite significant of the two parts of his own personality, <coughs> recognizing the anger that he holds inside. But here's what was significant, is that once the art, that he put his own anger out there in this pictorial form, and the art therapist in turn accepted that from him, he started working. And he started connecting with the art therapist for the next six months. He continued to do a great deal of artwork until he was able to finally parole from the institution because he no longer exhibited anger. And that was significant. I had an opportunity to go to China uh, last November and I visited one of the juvenile uh, detention facilities with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Joan Hu. He says he's the original Dr. Hu. 
and he worked in a facility where they weren't allowed to bring art in. But eventually he was able to break down those barriers and he started this new directive. And this is really awesome. Um, he would take a light stick or a light ball and he learned that through time-lapse photography, he can dance with the inmates and create pictorial forms of the movement of these lights through time-lapse photography and eventually start outlining the figures of the people so that you would have these images and the, and the inmates, the juvenile detention uh, residents, were fascinated by what emerged out of this. But then John Hu took this even further. He took these images out of the institution and went to a local community and said, we're going to take these images and we're now going to create a mural. And you're going to, from the community, paint these images the way you want to on the wall. And then he took photos of this image and brought it back to these guys. And what these guys realized was that there was a connection between the inside and the outside. They knew who they were, they knew who they were. And there was an interconnection. They started to be heard, they started to be validated, they started changing their behavior. A colleague of mine, this is gonna be the last case that I'm gonna show you. I do have another mural to show you tomorrow if you so choose. Um, Mary Ellen Ruff is an art therapist that works in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and she worked with juvenile detention facility that housed five different units, including ORR, the Office of uh, Refugee Resettlement. Because sometimes many of the people that we imprison don't deserve to be imprisoned, but we still have to work with them. And we still now have to take away the negative label that was thrust upon them for absolutely no reason, because they happened to come to the United States at the wrong time. So these children were taken away from their families and they were put in these institutions 1,500 miles away from where they crossed the border. And now Mary Ellen needs to see that they are being validated, they're getting a sense of self, and they still need to be able to work with the others inside. So she created this mural project in which they, after some time of discussing uh, the various themes and working together through art therapy, they decided as a group to come up with the um, Carl Jung quote that says, I'm not what happened to me, I'm what I choose to become. And they created this mural that stretched along the entire wall of this institution. Now here's the key, for the protection of those inside ORR, they could not be out there at the same time as the other residents of the juvenile justice setting. So while it was for their protection, it continued to isolate them and give them a label. But what Mary Ellen did was bring these, these kids out in, in shifts and they would all work on the mural together apart from each other. And they would all respect each other's space and they would all contribute. This was along one side of the wall. Yes, it is also, um, it is also in, in the book as well, but I'll explain that in a sec, but you can certainly take a photo of that, absolutely. Or send me your email and I would be happy to get you images of this. Yeah. Um, because it's now been published, so it's out there. Um, this is one of them, this is what they came up with. Again, I am not uh, what happened to me. Now I'm gonna uh, skip through this last one just to give some uh, final information here in summary. Uh, so Peach, sorry, that makes me laugh every time. <laughs> so in summary, through social interactions, people are labeled. Through these labels, the role of social participants are defined, including adolescents who are branded deviant or delinquent. Such labels are maintained through self-appraisals, these those that are delinquent are caught in this downward spiral. The art therapists have unique tools that can design new interactions with aid and relabeling people, validating and reinforcing new behaviors and identities. In turn, a positive self-appraisal can be established and can ultimately end the cycle of the deviant identity. I just want you all to know that a lot of this material was taken from chapter seven of a new book. Uh, this book right here, admittedly, this is a shameless plug. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, thank you very much. I think I got through it all. Okay. And I know we have questions. Uh, there are none now. Do we have questions? Tomorrow. Tomorrow we have questions. Otherwise, she will start me.